So for those of you who don't know, uh, I'll start with Jeff on the far side. Jeff Lowenfels is a, uh, you know, 45 plus year gardening author uh, out of Alaska. But most of us in this room know him from his uh, Teeming with Microbes, Teeming with Fungi, and Teeming with Nutrients series of books, which is like essentially the Holy Grail trilogy for people who love this kind of stuff, right? And so uh, he has also got a new book coming out in October. Um, uh, all about autoflowers. And it's fantastic. Uh, I've been able to check out parts of it um, as it went to the publisher, and it's uh, very much an introduction to autoflowers. And, and because of that, um, I see Jeff as, as uh, an evangelist for autoflowers. And then to his right is my other good friend, Seth Crawford, and some of you may know him as a co-founder with his brother Eric of um, Oregon CBD Seeds uh, near Albany. And, um, and so they're focused on uh, heavy-duty, uh, non-GMO, heavy analytical breeding there at their, at their laboratory, and with the goal of developing uh, particular chemovars that can target uh, particular symptom issues for patients. And so uh, they started with CBD, uh, they have uh, figured out the CBG, they're on their way to the Varens, and, um, and it's fantastic. Um, much to the joy and chagrin of, of cannabis farmers throughout the country, their, their seeds continually get outstripped because as, no, as many as they produce, uh, everyone just then goes and buys those and then they're out again. And so, uh, you know, if, if people vote with their wallets, uh, people are voting for Oregon CBD. So thank you gentlemen for joining us today. So I'm gonna have a sip of water here and then off we go. All right, so so most people may understand that autos finish faster, but that doesn't seem to be, that doesn't mean the best application for autos are readily apparent to everyone. So I would like to hear you both, starting with you, Jeff, um, how will autos influence cannabis growing and horticulture going forward? Well, let me give two different answers. Um, the book, uh, as you indicated, is really a, an introductory book. I, I like to say it's a book for your sister and your brother. It's a book for your, your Uncle Bob and Aunt Sally. It's not a book for a professional grower. I'm convinced that autoflower cannabis is going to change the general population's attitude about cannabis because it's the next tomato plant. Once in a lifetime, I'm 70 years old, it's only happened to me once, once in a lifetime a new plant is introduced to the general horticultural gardening public. The last time it happened it was the snap pea. They took over the pea world uh, and every gardener grows snap peas a couple of times during their career and probably every year. That's what's going to happen, I think, to these autoflowers because they're so easy to grow, their quality has risen so high as a result of the genetics uh, and so that's the first answer. The second answer is this is a plant which you can grow on a deck, which you can grow outside in a garden, you can grow it in a perennial bed, you can grow it in a pot in the ground. Uh, and so it's something that is accessible to all growers, not just people who have big farms or a big greenhouse. And because they don't have a photo period, it means that people who live in northern climates like Alaska, uh, where on September 21st your plant finally gets the darkness that it needs to set flower, you also get a frost that night. Uh, and then finally, for those who do professionally grow, here is a plant which you can use to interspace between your plants as they veg, the same thing, your plants as they flower, you just put them in, they don't care what the light is, you can give them 20, 24 hours of light, they're gonna flower based on their genetics, and so you can use your spare space. This is a dream for the entire horticultural world. Fantastic. So, so Seth, I, I know you're coming from a little different uh, direction. Uh, Jeff and I share that we're very interested in home growers and patient growers, but your customers and the people you are talking, I mean, I know you're a heavy patient guy, so I'm not saying you're not into patients, but, but your customers are very demanding, right? And so, um, so what are you seeing as, as far as the advantages for autoflowers for folks that are, are, are growing at a scaled level at, at, at acreage size? Yeah, and I would I would say since this is going to be on the internet for uh, ever, yeah. right? Yeah, this is for posterity. Yeah, this would be um, go back and take a look if you're very interested about geeking out on uh, some of the historical background on ruderalis. That's the the technical term for autoflowering plants. Ruderalis is Latin for uh, derived from ruderal, which is uh, 
rubble, from the rubble. These are plants that can grow anywhere. Like they can grow where it freezes. They can grow through frost. They can grow in very, very crazy situations and actually finish. The, the trick at industrial scale is uh, really being able to get them in the ground at the right time. So whether that's a direct seeding or transplanting before the, the plant goes through stress, there's some underlying genetic mechanisms that lead the plant to uh, go directly into flower when it senses uh, a stressful situation. Uh, just to step back for a second, because of that posterity sake, um, take a look for that geek out moment at Ernie Smalls. Uh, Ernie Smalls is a Canadian researcher who's been working on cannabis related issues for the last 45 years, a uh, brilliant gentleman. Uh, and he is, he's the person that was responsible for coming up for the industrial hemp 0.3 THC rule. And if you go back and look at his earlier writings, it was based on taking a leaf off of the top of the plant rather than testing the top eight inches of flower uh, at 0.3%. Um, hopefully that's gonna be incorporated into the USDA rules as they uh, move forward with the farm bill. But in 2018, he wrote a seminal paper, and I, I'm sure that this is going to go down as one of those testaments to autoflowering plants in the, in the long term. Uh, the, the paper is about highlighting the fact that these day-neutral autoflowering plants um, represent really the peak in human agriculture. So in a lot of other crops, the reasons and rationales that we have for expanding the total productivity of each individual crop on a per acre basis has come down to uh, plant breeders, geneticists, et cetera, over long periods of time, being able to make the plants more compact, make them more uniform, and take wild types of plants that tend to have seeds in varying places on the plant uh, and consolidate them into a usable, machine harvestable, uh, really energy dense uh, organism. And that's been a, uh, true for, for many of the other crops uh, that have been domesticated. Ernie Smalls goes so far as to say that that is the most profound thing that we have seen in over 13,000 years of human agriculture is this move towards, uh, he calls them semi-dwarf or dwarf uh, germplasm. So the title of the paper is Dwarf Germplasm, uh, and essentially it's about how to get tremendously large yields, uh, both for food crops, if you're growing for seed, hopefully in places where they're not growing for sensimia or cannabinoid products. Uh, we can get into that later. Um, but also for cannabinoid production in general. So it's, it's all about being able to maximize the space, minimize the inputs, and uh, really allow both farmers and people who benefit from these compounds to have more access uh, to them and, and to benefit from this plant. And autoflowering plants are tremendous at this. Yeah, maybe we ought to explain. <clears throat> so these plants, if you're, if you're not familiar with autoflowers, two things. First of all, they'll start to flower in 18 days up to three weeks, they'll just flower, period, uh, which is pretty incredible. Which is pretty incredible. Um, and then the, the, the other thing about them is uh, that they, that you can, you can, you can overdo it with them. Uh, this is a plant that grew quickly. It, they were discovered in, in, in uh, about 1900, 1903. Uh, scientists found them in the v Volga River area in Russia. Uh, he described it. It had low, low THC or no THC, and so they basically forgot about them. And then in the 70s, people started to say, hmm, maybe we could breed these. And so, uh, you know, the breeding happened. And then in 2003, uh, a guy was able to successfully commercialize one called Lowrider. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, these are the ultimate heirloom kind of thing. They're not a land race really, I don't think anymore, but they're, they're heirloom and you can, you can breed these things. They, they go flower in the, the you know, 18 day, third, third week. By nine weeks, they're finished. You harvest it. Wow, the breeding potential and opportunities on these things are just spectacular. So, so the opportunity to be able to improve on this plant like we have in theory improved on some of, the, on some of our agricultural plants is absolutely incredible. Another thing that I love about them is that um, if you have got a greenhouse environment, but you don't, you really want to um, supplement with light for for whatever reason, um, you can actually do two cycles of auto flowers without light depth. And that's crazy, right? You know, um, I'm, I'm experimenting with that this year, and um, the, the biggest thing I ran into was trying to keep them warm, because autoflowers don't particularly like to start off their life with cold feet. 
Um, but the idea is, you know, you can you can have your uh, you can you can start something early spring and have it finish Fourth of July and then put put uh, seeds in that same no-till environment and let those pop and they're done by October first. So you've run two cycles. And, and, uh, and you don't have to pull any tarp, which we all love to avoid, right? <laughs> and so, um, so that's fantastic. And the other thing I wanted to hit on um, was, uh, was how appropriate these are for patients and for people with lower mobility. Because like Jeff mentioned, these are very uh, compact plants, right? These pretty much top out at around three, three and a half feet. Um, and, and because of that, you don't have to do the reaching and they're not hard to break down. And, and um, you know, the patient can stand up and look all around them for mold instead of you know trying to work with some of these nine footers where they're just impossible to work with they're beautiful and I love them and I want to toke them right but but they're really they're you know they're all caged and difficult to work with so this is something that that folks who are living in an apartment who are growing in a tent can grow for these together with no sweat and you don't even need to scrog them and and then if you're a patient they're so Easily, to, easy to use, and always going to flower in a in a particular time frame and be ready to go. That really opens up the door. But let's not leave the impression that these are little teeny baby flowers because they're little teeny plants. You know, I mean, there there are there's a there are some I've seen colas that are 80 grams. Wow, unbelievable! Yeah. And they'll have you know 10 of these colas on a plant. So so these are not the 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 low rider that you remember. These are a totally new plant ready for prime time. Just to add on to that, so yes, you can make them flower uh, in general uh, for field production. We're looking at about 77 days from the time that the seed emerges uh, in a starter plug, transplanted into the field within the week. Uh, 77 days from that time of emergence until we harvest it. And what Jeff is saying is absolutely true. What we see with uh, uh, regular uh, photoperiod plants is the stem and stalk weight accounts for about 27.5% of the total biomass of the plants. With these uh, day neutral plants, you're looking at roughly 19%. So this is an order of, you know, talking about a significant percentage of uh, increased biomass. Now the one thing that I will say, and it's a, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a brain bubble, is try growing one of these in a 100 gallon smart pot. Okay, so it's really nice for patients or someone who's just trying to experiment with one of these plants in a three-gallon container to have it on their deck. It's amazing. It's really cool. They're very useful plants. They stay small. They're not going to flip out if you hit them with a porch light in the middle of the night when you go outside. Um, but if you put one in a much bigger container, you're going to notice that the flowering system is genetically determined based on stress, and stress particularly to the root zone. So you can actually grow five, six, seven, eight nine foot tall auto flowering plants if they have enough root space and they're not restricted. They're actually, when we think about cannabis, one of the things that researchers always go back to is the amazing plasticity of that plant and its ability to respond to the environment uh, that it's placed in. Auto flowering plants, these day neutrals are, to me, it's the epitome of that. All right, so, so I, I, I'm going to pull together something Jeff just said and something you just said and, and take it further. So Jeff uh, loves to talk about how these scrappy little plants from Russia, um, you know, you can put them in, in, in rocky, crappy soil, and they still very much thrive. And, and you have spoken to me before, just like you just did to all of us, uh, that, that, that this, it's the stress of the, of the roots hitting the bottom of the pot that's going to trigger flowering. And, but I've never heard you give this example before of, of these large 100-gallon pots, um, which makes me very interested in growing an 8-foot auto flower just to do it, right? So here's my question, is that if, if, um, uh, if how, do, how do they grow in soil then? Because like I know you go right into the ground, but there's no eventual bottom of the pot. So there has got to be something going on scientifically. Yeah, genetic. It is genetic. Yeah, so, so what's the trigger? Yeah, in, in part. Uh, and one of the things, when you're, there are many, many different soil conditions. Uh, in the Willamette Valley, we're blessed with uh, a number of things, including, we'll get into this as, as we talk about farming at scale. But we have, in certain locations, 38 feet of topsoil. And if it's properly prepared, um, you can end up with very large plants. I mean, we, we had plants that were averaging a pound and a half per, per plant planted very densely uh, in, in the field just north of Corvallis uh, last summer for one of our R&D trials. Um, it, it really comes down to proper soil preparation and the ability for those roots to just go out and, and do their thing. You know, and I, in the book, I stress that, it's, that 
from the perspective of an amateur growing these things, they they don't really like to be repotted all the time. I mean, you, 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 so I always tell people to grow them in the original container. Uh, I started out with three three gallon containers because you know I thought the plants were cute and everything else. And there's something they call it now super auto flowers. They're really the same thing, but different soil structure and different soil amounts. And so now I'm telling people that five gallons is good, that you know ubiquitous hardware bucket, uh, but seven gallons is even better. Uh, and you put the seed right in it. I mean, I don't even start them in a, uh, because I think if, if, they, if they are stressed, they will flower. Uh, and the worst thing you can have is, is something that flowers when it's just, you know, <laughs> make a, oh no, what did I do? Because they're not cheap seeds. Uh, although you can grow your own seeds and they become cheap. Yeah, it's disappointing when they're five inches tall. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and I actually, I actually did that for my first time, and I have, I can admit to making that mistake. My first tray last year, I still like my idea. I put them in uh, root riot plugs, which oh, I, I like yeah. because um, when I find when I propagate right into soil, um, it's a lot more difficult to keep the soil or keep the seed in a uh, moist environment. Right, uh, t the the top of the soil dries out really fast. Whereas those root riots, while they are soil, and so I'll put the seed in there. Let it pop, and as soon as I've got like you know you know firmly established cotyledon leaves, then I go ahead and I put it in before the the roots are coming out the bottom. Um, and but they do make some cute little plants. I mean, you I saw a little plant growing in a thimble, with a with a with a uh, uh, you know it had a beautiful little head on it about that big. It was such a sexy little thing, you know. It was just yeah kind of thing you put on Instagram and go hey look at this, and everybody goes whoa wow. And, and so I had a tray of these, right? I had a tray of these, and and I let them sit too long in the tray before I, because because you're right, you said yeah. you know that same week, you know. Right. And so so I let them sit to there, and so I had a tray of very expensive, <laughs> beautiful eight inch autoflowers, and each one had this gorgeous big nug on top, <laughs> and and you know um, the uh, the yield per weight was incredible. <laughs> The yield per fifteen dollars seed was not right, so so I'm growing my own and still p paying fifteen dollars a gram, which is like not not a win. No. But they made awesome gifts to people because you give somebody a small plant with this fully mature bud, and you're like, here you go, snip it off, like let it dry for a couple days and smoke it, and they're like, really? Well, and actually, you know, I know we're getting getting out of order here, but but but. In keeping in my idea that this is the next tomato, I'm convinced that that in in the next future few years, you're going to be able to walk into you know your Whole Foods or wherever at Christmas time, and they're going to have a little shelf, and it's going to have you know 30 little autoflower plants sitting there that look like little Christmas trees that are decorated, you know. And then at Easter Easter time, you know, you're going to have a pl you know plants with that little that little green plastic crap you know around the base of it. <laughs> This is, the, you, the, these plants are unbelievable. They are so much fun to grow. I just cannot, you can, I, I'm peeing in my pants. I love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, careful there. <laughs> So, so I want to uh, I want to bring the conversation back to medical, which obviously I keep bringing this conversation back to because right. those are the people I work with a lot. And so, um, and we're going to keep going with you, Jeff, and then we'll we'll jump back to Seth. So, so um, in, in terms of medical, Jeff, I'd like you to speak a bit to um, the ease of growing, and and I've heard you talk about how you can actually do too much, right? right. So I want to I would like to hear that, and then and then and then Seth, would you pick up um, since you are analytically breeding these to help with particular ailments, I'd like to hear from you how uh, the, the, the breeding of autoflowers are, can be so targeted because they, they're, so, they're so quick to cycle. So, but Jeff, let's start with you. Well, you know, these are, these are un unbelievable plants uh, and, and, and they just, they just they're, you know, the only thing I can compare it to is a marigold. <laughs> you know, I read a garden column in the in the newspaper up in Anchorage, and and you know, marigolds are the one plant I say, you know, you gotta have, you gotta plant something or you're not a real gardener. So you plant a marigold, and you can have your kid do it with you because it's the only seed. You stick the seed in the ground; it's like a sunflower seed. There's certain seed you just put them in the ground, you walk away. You don't do anything, and they grow well. They grow the way they're supposed to grow, and that's what happens with these plants. If you put too much fertilizer in the soil, if you put any for I. I don't put any fertilizer the first time you grow it because you may not need it ever. Uh, you know, you got to watch these plants very carefully. They grow so quickly that, it, you know, that when the white fly or whatever decides to hit it, all of a sudden it's gone through the stage where the, where the you know, the right kind of juice is. Wait a minute. What happened to my plant? It's not the same plant anymore. And the insect moves on. I mean, these things 
don't need a lot of care. Now, you got to keep an eye out for mildew and the kinds of things that you normally do, but they grow so quickly uh, that, that, that if, you, if you push them too much, they're not going to grow well. The only thing I do to mine to start when I buy a seed from somebody, I don't know what the, you know, whether it's going to be any good. I put the mycorrhizal fungi on it, and that is all I do. And, and generally, I've never had to fertilize any of my plants. And they grow so fast. Um, for those of you who grow indoors, especially in tens, you don't really have enough time to screw them up. Right. And that's fantastic, right? right? right. You know, I had never heard your example, Jeff, about um, the, the, the plant growing through the stage of life that appealed to any particular right. pest. But that makes sense. The first round I did, I've got no mold issues, no pest issues. And, and where, you know, where I live on Vashon Island, right. uh, we don't have that much pests, but we always get mold, right? And, and it's just that their life cycle is so short, a lot of that stuff doesn't have a time to uh, take over. Right. And so they've been bred to get rid of the mold. Uh, so I know the, the people that grow at uh, New Breed Seeds, that's what they were looking for, mold. Let's get rid of that mold, and they, they did it, so. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of being able to use these plants for different medical conditions. I always defer to Dr. Ethan Russo, who is somewhere out here. Uh, so I'm not going to speak to exactly what type of compounds are going to help for particular ailments. All we know is that all of these different compounds are very useful in trying to figure out exactly how to triangulate and make use of those compounds and get them into plants in a way that's useful for, for patients and for, for people uh, across the world is, is really our goal. So when we look at, at different plants from a, a breeding perspective, um, what we're really trying to do is we need photoperiod plants for very particular locations. We need plants that are going to flower early but are still photoperiod sensitive. And we need autoflowering plants so that you can deploy these, uh, these plants in basically, once you've developed a particular chemobar, you can deploy them anywhere in the world. And, and that's really what makes these different compounds available to people. So having CBD varieties, having CBG varieties, CBC rich plants, uh, more importantly now working on CBDV, CBGV, and, and CBCV. Uh, along with other, other minor compounds um, that we don't even know how to, to quantify and don't have reference standards for. Um, all of those are incredibly important, and not just from a, from, a, from a patient perspective, being able to grow it at home and take care of your own family or take care of yourself through the joy of actually gardening a plant. There's something emancipatory about being able to do that. I think everybody feels that. Um, but being able to make sure that those compounds are available at scale, at a price that individuals can actually afford to, to treat themselves. It's, it's pretty important. And these plants make that possible. One, one good example of that is being able to uh, use the plasticity of autoflowering plants for a particular ecological niche. So uh, most, most people here are probably familiar with how much grass seed the Willamette Valley produces. The Willamette, Willamette Valley is home to 95% of the world's grass seed production. We're able to grow grass seed in the Willamette Valley, for better or for worse. Uh, due to the climate, uh, the climate that we have. So we don't normally get rain in the Willamette Valley through the middle of July up until the middle of August. We have a month of, generally speaking, very, very dry conditions. And it allows a competitive advantage of grass seed farmers who have good irrigation and great soil uh, to be able to grow this particular crop, cut it down, field dry it, it sits in the field for five to seven days, and then it gets combined and picked up. No other place in the world has that steady climate that allows for that particular, even though you know, most people like food rather than, than uh, lawns, but no one else is able to really do this. We can actually do the same thing and use this, tech, this ecological advantage paired with a technological and horticultural advantage by using these autoflowering plants to plant thousands of acres of very rare and useful compounds that are present in these plants after specific breeding. Uh, grow them out and dry them in a way that doesn't require a huge drying infrastructure that you would, you would have to have for other crops or in other locations. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge, uh, I think it's a huge step forward in terms of being able to make these compounds available, make them an everyday thing so that you can literally walk into uh, any supermarket and find something that is useful in targeting a particular malady. We just need to figure out exactly what those which is which, yeah, yeah, right on. I've got two follow-up questions for you, Seth. Um, the first one is, is you know, I hear from a lot of folks when I, when you know, I've become kind of an evangelist for autoflowers because I'm so into them. But people, people come up to me and they're like, like, you know, we don't want 
auto flowers because we can't breed with them and and they're they're not for everybody and I want my nine foot plants and you already dispelled the nine, the short plants thing I didn't I did not know they were taller but um, but I like that you just said that there are particular nature environments where you want the photo period some that are photo period but finish early and then there's the auto flowers I've not heard that analysis before so will you go a little more in depth in that um, uh, why do we still need the other two categories? Oh, we don't. It's just, it's nice to have diversity. Well, wait a minute. We do. <laughs> well, we do, we do need them. I mean, we need them to breed with because That's the true. land race strains are a photo period. Uh, and so we need those. So yeah, I mean, we need them. Good example is uh, when we're, this is something that a lot of us living in a, in a black market, it was difficult to be able to get information about the way that people produce in, in uh, other areas of the country or other areas of the world. A uh, great example is Kentucky and Tennessee. So Kentucky and Tennessee have incredibly wet July, August, and Septembers, and then they have at the very end of September, and then through October, they have perfect weather. I mean, it's, it's almost like what Oregon is like in late August, early September before the rains hit. So as most of us know, here, we need to make sure that our plants are out of the field, taken care of, harvested, dried, uh, properly handled. Uh, it, if it's not done by the middle of September, you're, you're really you're really pushing yourself. Um, you're really chancing it. In those areas, it's, it's the opposite. You want to actually get your plants out at the end of October. So in that case, a, a long season, a full season photo period sensitive plant is really the way to go. But, but yeah, <laughs> if, you, if, you have a, if you have an auto flowering plant in certain areas, you can plant your auto flowers in early May, go back and replant in mid-July and end up getting two crops and, and basically double the productivity uh, of what you have available to you. See, unless you live in Alaska where you're allowed <laughs> to have six plants, three of which are allowed to be in flower, you know? So I always tell people, don't treat this like broccoli, you know, where you plant it all at once. You stagger it. And I don't mean you wait for the crop to, to harvest. You know, every two weeks or every week, you put in a couple of more seeds. And then when the regulator comes to your house, you go, no, I only got three in flower, you know. Forget the fact that I got 50 pounds of <laughs> drying weed over here. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but they really are. For, everything you say, again, sort of emphasizes the idea that, boy, this is something that a home gardener would, you know, people grow heirloom tomatoes. You know, Mary, Mary uh, next door neighbor, she's famous because she's got the Oregon summer spring. And, and George next door is famous because his are plum tomatoes that make the best sauce, you know, and they give them away, and, and that's the same thing that's going to happen with these autoflowers. Mine, look at the colors on this one. Look at the landscape capabilities on this one. You know, they're not, they're going to be landscape plants. They're going to be a plant that everybody accepts. We've got to get rid of that stigma, but it's happening, and this is the plant that's going to carry us over the line, I'm convinced, and help the big plants as well, so. I really like what you said, too, about neighbors sharing, right, because yeah. if, if we all have got plant limits, um, we're limited by our variety, and you know, it's just like tomatoes, right? You know, if you grow tomatoes at home, you're still going to end up buying tomatoes at the store. It's not like right. commercial tomato growers are all hosed because we're all growing at home tomatoes. You buy the ones at the store so you get the seeds so you can grow them yourself, but okay. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, but this is another great idea because yeah. neighbors can you know, grow different varieties and trade and it creates increased community and everybody gets to try more wheat, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's a win as well. So last year in the, at the Alaska State Fair, they actually, in Kenai, they had a cannabis entry thing. And I'm convinced every, every state fair in the country is going to have an auto flower cannabis contest. You know, I mean, it's just, this is the best thing that ever happened to our industry because it's going to get mom and pop and Uncle Bob and Aunt Sally, who normally would be against it, into it. And that's what we really need so we can get the taxes out of it. Amen. Amen. I will say that they are a pain in the ass. Why? From a breeding perspective. <laughs> so we make feminized seed. Uh, we don't use males. Um, and if you can come to me with a good argument as to what is actually contained in the male genome that's useful and how you can access and figure out what those traits are, I'm, I'm open to having my mind changed. That's what science is about. Uh, but the way that we operate is that we make feminized seed and we use females because it allows us to know what the chemotype is, to know what the terpene profiles are, to know what the potency is, the flower structure, and then be able to figure out how that's inherited from generation to generation. Autoflowering plants are a different animal in the sense that when you plant that seed, that clock is ticking. 
you can't just go, oh, hey, that's a great plant. Well, I'll just re-veg it and get some cuttings off of it and use it for breeding. It's done. Uh, great example of this, last year we were, I was working through, had about 20 different uh, CBG rich plants trying to figure out what the, the average ratio of CBG to THC was to identify which plants we could use or at least what the frequency was uh, for developing really, really high ratio plants. And one of the individuals from that population, we sent the, the results into a third party lab after we tried to screen them in house. And they came back and said, whoa, 50% of your total cannabinoid profile was a compound that we've never seen before. It's not a terpene, it looks like a cannabinoid from its molecular weight, but we don't have any reference standards to be able to identify what it is. And this is, this is Pixis in Portland, they're a very good lab. They have more cannabinoids uh, available to them than, than most labs in the country, and very good equipment, very well-trained personnel. And the person I was interacting with said, can you send me another sample? And I'm, I'm tearing my hair out saying, that was the only plant. <laughs> that was it. It's gone. Like, it's gone. You, you can't get that back. And so you go back and, and grow hundreds of those plants out, and you never find that same plant again. So for a structured breeding program, when you're trying to isolate these individual compounds and turn them into useful field-ready or home grower-ready uh, uh, seeds, it poses a significant challenge um, because you only have a certain amount of time. We have uh, literal professionals now working at our company who are trying to find other ways of making this happen. And it's a, this is a, it's a significant technological challenge. So there's ways around it. Um, but it takes a ton of space, a ton of time, and a lot of motivation to, to really be able to isolate them. So just a, they're, they're a different animal when it comes to the breeding standpoint. But that's from a professional perspective, from a, you know, real amateur perspective. If you take two auto-flowering plants and, and breed them together, you can breed them. Uh, and they're fun. It's nine weeks, holy crow, and all of a sudden, you know, hey, I think I'll name this after my wife. You know what I mean? I mean, it's... Just like the big guys do, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but it's really kind of fun, and the idea that you can get somebody's, you know, genetics, and, and now I've got to be careful when I talk about genetics you can get this into conference here. Trouble, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, folks, just too a little soon. side joke here, too you know, soon. too soon, too soon. <laughs> you know, you get somebody's great genetics, and you say, gee, I wonder if I, as an amateur, can I fool around with this stuff a little bit? You know, now you're not as exact as these guys, obviously, but you can. You can fool around with it, and, and you can do it all winter long, and, you know, under 20 hours of light, you can do it all night long. If you, you know I mean? It's just, this is a fun, fun plant to grow. Yeah, it can be difficult, and it can cause some problems, and if you're a professional grower, you got to adjust yourself a little bit, but Boy, if you are a professional grower and you're growing medical cannabis, get into these auto flowers, see what you think, see if we can improve the ability to get more medicine out there. So and it, oh, no. it's a, I think it's a really important point, too. You, you brought up the historical reference back to the lowrider varieties from 2003. That was a shitty plant. Oh, but the worst. It was the worst. I grew yeah. some of that, and it just made me sick to smoke. I mean, it's horrible. The terpene profile was terrible. Um, the structure was not great. But you could see the promise. Right. You, could, you could see the promise. And what it took was small-time breeders who were working under either medical programs or in their garage surreptitiously to improve those plants. And it wasn't until 2010 that I finally consumed something that changed my mind about autoflowering plants. Someone had taken uh, a, one of DJ Short's blueberry varieties, myrcene dominant with a, a number of different minor terpene pro, uh, different terp, uh, minor terpenes that end up making it a very calm uh, anti-anxiety experience. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful piece of work. But they finally instilled that into an autoflowering plant that made the effect and the flavor just as good or better than a lot of the other commercially available varieties at the time. And that was, that was the... No, you're right. The, the early ones... They were interesting, but they weren't any good, and that's why... You know, I remember, I remember there's a listserv called autoflowering.net which we kid about, they, they threw me off because I, I got on it and I said, gee, I'm writing this book, I need some pictures, and they threw me off, you know. So I finally, thanks to Shango, got back on again and, and Tad Hesse. Uh, but, but uh, you know, when they first started, and you would be on Grass City or one of those other forums, and you'd say, oh, I'm growing autoflowers, people laughed at you, they made fun of you, that you were stigmatized, and basically you were drummed out of the community. Uh, so somebody started the auto, auto net, you know, and if you go back at the way, you know, people were just sort of struggling, struggling, struggling. And around 2008, 9, somewhere right in that area, they hit the sweet spot. 
you know, and then they started laughing at other people. And the pictures, oh, my God. And on Instagram, just yesterday, I saw one. Somebody had a, 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 a one of these movies where it went from seed to harvest, you know, in two seconds. Holy crow. Fabulous. I'm telling you, folks, get some seeds. You are going to love these. And, and you know, uh, uh, I love to buy feminized seeds for, for my own home growing and to help patients, right? Because uh, being able to take males out of the mix, if you're not breeding them, this is, this is a win. But right now, there are still lots of autoflower seeds that are being sold regs, right? So you're going to get boys and girls. And so, you know, if you, if you really, uh, if you just want the flowers and you don't want to uh, play with the plant, as Jeff is suggesting, get yourself some, like, fantastic, modern, you know, feminized seeds from like Mephisto Genetics or somebody who's got a good reputation and it's all very plug and play just like Jeff is describing uh, but if you want to enjoy that that extra horticulture experience of making something that did not exist in the world until you did it um, you know find yourself a pack of auto flower reg seeds and pop a couple of them that you think sound interesting and uh, it's really easy to collect male pollen you know you, you take you take a branch and put it in a bag and you shake it a little bit. Now you got a bag of pollen and you walk to the other side or maybe your friend's house and you've got a paintbrush and you put some of that pollen on there and you, you paint it onto one branch of the plant. And then when you're done next year, you're going to have like, you know, 40 or 50 seeds. And, and like you said, you get to name it, which can be the most fun part. But you don't have to wait till next year. That's the other thing. I mean, you know, these things grow indoors really well. Uh, you know, in Anchorage, we're really excited about, about the opportunity to grow these things because we get a photo period the same time we get the frost. And man, this is going to just change our whole world. It's going to be fabulous. Right on. So uh, autoflowers, as you just heard from talking about the lowrider, uh, old Kimavar, um, you know, a lot of people nowadays still consider them cute, right? But professionals are like, nah, you know, this is, this is just uh, something on the side that isn't going to, you know, matter to the rest of us. But then, you know, you meet Seth and you, you, you walk acre upon acre of these beautiful plants in September and the air is filled with terpenes and, you know, you're just like, oh my gosh, I want to lay up, lay up my tent and just like live here, right? And so um, what I'd like to hear from you both are, you know, um, commercial applications, right? Or, and specifically, let's, let's talk about yield and quality um, because it's one thing that it's all incredibly easy and we can grow them in tents, but, but a lot of people are thinking about, you know, uh, scale for commercial and also, am I going to get enough flour for my effort for home growth? So, so I'd like you both to kind of speak to that option. Well, here in Oregon, I mean, I, I would start with new breed seeds, frankly. Um, they're, in, they're, you know, they're from Oregon. They were the first ones to get their license to be able to sell seeds. And, and uh, uh, they are growing for commercial growers. Uh, I think the last time I, I spoke to them, they said, yeah, you know, uh, they're selling the seeds at the dispensary. It's just a pain in the ass. So they want to go home, and there are lots of commercial growers that are using these things for a couple of reasons, all the ones we've already discussed. If you're growing indoors on racks, if you get the right size plant, <laughs> double racks, triple racks, you know, you can use the whole ceiling all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, the space on these things makes it so that you can interspace them in between existing uh, plants, which is really a useful thing to do. You, you know, you've already got the heat, you've already got the light if you're indoors, and to be able to interspace a little small plant that's not going to detract from the bigger plants that you're trying to grow, there's, you know, it doubles your ability to get more income as a result of doing this stuff. So, I, so in that regard, it's important. And then, of course, the idea that you can get something in seven, nine, you, you know, if you want to go longer, 12 weeks, wow. I mean, from a commercial perspective, if the yield is good and the and the and the, and the power is good, if that's the the terpene spectrum, uh, you know, you're you're there. Why would you want to grow anything but? Uh, so so I, I really highly encourage you to try these. They're really quite something. And to contact uh, you know people like New Breeze Seeds and and get names of other commercial breeders that are doing it, go see what they're doing. We all share information, that's what we do, so. Oh, I'm glad you reminded me of that, too. Um, before you answer, I wanna plug uh, with the correct URL, autoflower. Dot net. Yeah. And because I, I, this is a, a Jeff story was spot on, right? <laughs> the, these were the people who were laughed off of other forums for using autoflowers. And so they decided to create their own where they could be misfit toys together. 
And so, um, you know, one of the things that we've lost in our scene, I think, as people have, got, have gotten more money focused, is everybody's got IP now, and everybody wants to hide and protect things. And, you know, back in the day, outside of just, like, not wanting to go to jail, people were really open to sharing within the community, sharing best practices, swapping seeds, all this kind of stuff, which, which you're seeing less on the commercial side, but you're still seeing uh, on this group at autoflower.net because they are, um, they are all trying to learn from each other. They are sharing best practices because they haven't mattered for a while. And uh, it's, it really excites me to see some of the leaders in that particular community knowing what things are gonna be like in three or four years when autoflowers just falls off people's li lips so easily. And, and these people will be the new generation of superstars and, and that, you know, that's cool when, when people who, yeah, I love an underdog story, right? So, so, so. And they have some of the best bud porn I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the photos are just incredible. So, so Seth, going back to you, um, specifically, you know, the, the people that you are selling seed to are growing at acreage size, right? And, um, and, and when people are, I mean, you don't have to give people pitches about your seeds anymore, but, but just for the sake of this conversation, what does that pitch sound like when they're all like, you know, like, really? You want me to, you know, plant a whole field of these, what are essentially still probably going to be smaller plants? Wait a minute, what's the name of the company again? Which one? Yours. Oh, we, we don't advertise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I owe you like five emails, so we, I, I can't, we can't handle the advertising right now. Uh, honestly, we, we don't pitch it to people. People come to us and say, hey, I really want to try this. Really? I really want to try this. And we say, no, you don't. It's really hard. You're going to fuck up. You're, you're not going to do it right. It's taken us, it took us three years to figure out how to get the plants in the field without having uh, flowering in trays and actually getting a good yield. <laughs> this year we're moving on to large scale uh, field trials for uh, different density of planting. And we've stepped back and we're actually putting it into the hands of much more competent farmers who've been farming other crops for uh, their entire lives. And, and, and how many cultivars? Oh, that's such a technical uh, question. Roughly, how many different kinds of plants, roughly? One. Okay. <laughs> Not really, yeah. but uh, there, there, there's a number, of, a number of different varieties that okay. are out there. And it, it all comes down, for us, it's not about cultivars. Ours are chemotypes. Right, we, chemo. we look at plants as uh, having very particular chemical compounds that are replicable generation after generation. I should correct it. It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> uh, but it's, it really it comes down to trying to figure out how you, in the same way that you're describing maximizing space in a small area inside, this is how do you maximize the productivity on a per acre basis uh, over thousands of acres. And it really comes down to uh, what we've seen with successful farmers is either direct seeding, which is wrought with all kinds of problems that most of you probably don't care about, but it all, all comes down to the depth of the, the planting of the seed. Uh, and you're talking about literally millimeters will make or break success. Um, down, and then the other side of it is the density of planting for both weed suppression and to maximize uh, lateral, uh, minimize lateral branching and force the plants to basically just turn into one solid flower. Um, that's, that's really what we're, we're looking at this year. Uh, and then I would say for 2020, yeah, definitely, we'll be ready for you to buy auto-flowering seeds, uh, both type three CBD-rich plants and uh, type four uh, pure CBG lines. So what are the other advantages? I mean, it's clearly the short cycle is great for scaled agriculture. But uh, when I visited your farm, you were mentioning some other things, like the fact that the plants are uniform, so they're really easy to repeat cut on a sled, cut on a sled. So, so what, are the, what are the, you know, traditional farming advantages of this plant versus the photo period ones? Uh, the, the main one, and it, again, it's going to depend on your location. In certain areas, you can't cut the plant down and let it dry in the field. Uh, and a lot of people have had questions about that. We did, our, our team did some amazing experiments this last summer. Uh, long hours in the field, very hot conditions, harvesting about 15 acres, I believe it was about 38,000 plants uh, in the early August. Cutting them down, laying them down uh, in the field to basically cook at 100 degrees during the day uh, and then grind them up and put them into totes just to see how much CBD would be lost and what the terpene loss was going to be. And what we found was about, you're gonna lose about two thirds of your terpenes. Um, they're very volatile, they just, they vaporize, they're gone. But there's still enough 
uh, to be able to get some uh, some efficacy from uh, entourage effect, depending on the, the type of terpenes that you're working with and their their volatility. The heavier sesquiterpenes tend to stick around. The the really volatile monoterpenes are always going to be gone. But the moral of the story on that was that CBD content did not change. There was no statistical difference between plants that were cut down and dried in the field versus plants that were cut down and hung up uh, in, a, in a warehouse. So again, that's a, that's a great thing if you happen to have a very dry, late, uh, very dry late July, early August. But if you have a rainy period, that may not necessarily be the plant that you want to use. So it's, it's really about, like any farming or any, any cannabis production, it's about being able to use the plasticity of the plant to adapt to your own local ecosystem and climate. Right on. So, Seth, I'm going to give you a particular question here. It's just a sniglet off topic, but but it's very uh, it's very important for where we are today. And and what I want to ask you is, you know, your you know you have particular experience in the dangers of pollen contamination, right? And um, you know, since both feminized and regular auto seeds exist, I think this would be a good moment for you to make your pitch for for you know running, you know, not running males outdoors. Uh, I'd love you to share the story about your valley, just to make everybody more aware of the dangers of pollen. Uh, if you if you have a pollinated crop and you're growing outside, you're going to lose 30% of your total cannabinoids and 50% of your biomass. Uh, the the seed is a tremendous energy sapping. Uh, creation that, that ends up taking the power away from your plants and reducing the, the not only the profit, tr profitability, but the actual amount of cannabinoids that you can harvest outdoors. Uh, I know Oregon, uh, at this point, we're trying to launch uh, a nonprofit organization that will help in the future in terms of creating buffer zones between farms <clears throat> so that we don't have issues of pollen contamination. It's the uh, Oregon Cannabis Pinning Association, ocpa.org. It's the only thing I'll advertise today, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> And we're really just kind of in a, we're trying to raise awareness this year and then actually move into a more formal pinning system for 2020. Uh, but pollen outdoors is a, is a huge issue. And there are a number of people um, who are either growing regular male, female seeds or trying to create seed uh, outdoors just because you can produce so much. It's a, it's a tremendously uh, productive way to, to make seed. But we've had to basically go to a lot of small time breeders who are saying, oh man, this is the big rush. I want to make sure that I can make a bunch of seed this year and then sell it for next year. Not knowing that in doing so, not only are they not going to get a successful crop because there's other people who are doing that and now you have a contaminated crop yourself uh, with no purity that you won't be able to sell if, if you're a moral or ethical person, uh, but you're also going to destroy all of your surrounding neighbors' ability to actually grow a crop and have something that's valuable at the end of the year. So it really comes down, it's a, it's a touchy subject for a lot of people, but it is definitely, um, in terms of being able to create an environment <clears throat> that we all uh, can continue to produce cannabis in, and an environment that our kids can potentially continue to produce cannabis in, Oregon is one of those really, really lucky spots. We're in a sweet spot. We can grow good stuff, we have great breeders, we have good water, we have good land, uh, but we really need to make sure that we can protect that. And it's, pollen travels a long ways, long ways. It's, it's dangerous. And I think that, you know, uh, these, these pollen exclusion zones, which I've been calling them, do you have an actual official name for them? That sounds good. Yeah, pollen exclusion zone, yeah. So that's what I've been calling it to people. And, and the first time that Seth posted about this on their Instagram, um, it was ugly. You know, the, the, the thread was mostly people saying, you know, you know, you will not tell me what to do with my property, comma, damn it. You know, and Monsanto, yeah. you want to control the seeds. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and I get where people are coming from because I don't like to be told what to do either. But what it is, it's a it's an uh, it's an economic and horticultural opportunity for right where almost all of us live here. Um, and so what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, just like Napa Valley, right? Um, they are growing uh, world-class wine, but there are certain things that the community has all agreed to do and not do so that they don't screw up the, the, the uh, you know, the wineries and, and their ability to grow grapes because it brings so much economic uh, power to the region. 
And for me, that's what I see for, for these beautiful valleys throughout Oregon where they, can, where they can, you know, they've already got hemp farmers. It is a burgeoning industry that is, is light years ahead of, of, of many of the rest of the parts of the world that are going to try to follow up. And when you have a, a lead, even though I don't want anybody to tell me what to do with my property either, I really hope that those people would keep open minds because the, the, the reasons for not growing pollinating cannabis plants outdoors make a lot of sense for the Oregon community. And, and I think that is lost on a lot of people because they, aren't, they haven't let their ears be open to the argument yet. Well, I think people think it's about control. And, and the, the problem with this is that it's not about trying to prevent people from making seed. I encourage people to go, go, go do it. it. Like I've said before, it's emancipatory, not only to grow it, but to breed it and then see the outcome. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And it's part of what makes us human. We all could probably agree that people have a right to fire, right? You can have a fire on your property. That's cool until it jumps your fence and burns down your neighbor's house. At that point, that's your liability. It's not your fire. And that's really what we're looking at. Everyone in Oregon has a right to farm, but you don't have a right to exclude other people from being able to engage in meaningful economic activity that not only is helping th themselves, but helping other people. Isn't the general motto? Yeah. 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 yeah, your fun ends when the other guy's displeasure begins. And so you do not have a right to plant seeds outside, I would say. You don't have a right to do it, period. If it's going to impact your neighbor, you don't have that right. And also, for, for folks who are thinking about doing, you know, three, four plants in your backyard and you're going to bring in a male, that's way different than we're talking about, uh, you know, growing acres of regular seeds, unless right? Unless you're next door we're to talking, them. Yeah, unless you... <laughs> no, it's fine. Our, our, I mean, we've had to take, because of that, and, and we don't want to stop anybody from having that right, but to be able to protect our interests, we had to make sure that our greenhouses are sealed. We only make seed uh, in places that we're comfortable making it. And then once it comes out, we still have to test it just to make sure that it is what we we what we think it is. And to let you know that Seth practices what he preaches, um, it is really crazy to go into their breeding warehouses or, or greenhouses because they are they suck you in, right? So that none of the pollen escapes when you open it. They've got they've got all the air being pulled into uh, into a into a filter so that you open the door and you're like Arr! and then. You're and then you're sucked in so that all the pollen is kept inside, and that's cool, right? Yeah, it's, he had it's, straight it's, hair before he went in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right, so the last thing I want to hit, because we're, we're wrapping up here, is um, I want to go back, uh, you know, uh, uh, leave a little bit of the, 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 uh, the, the, the breeding analytics stuff and talk specifically about the smoke. Right, because because you know most everybody in here probably enjoys the taste and the experience of cannabis, and and you know I've I've smoked the stuff that you grow for extraction, right? And some of the stuff that you grow for extraction, these like 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 let's tear up these flowers, right? And like and I take them home and smoke, and I'm like, God damn, this is good Decent. stuff. Yeah, this is this is really good <laughs> flower, right? And so um, let's hit on just real quickly the fact that, you know, it may be convenient, it may be great for the valley, um, it, it may be good for patients, it may be extractable, but it's good smoke too. Let's start with you, Jeff, because I know that you love, uh, yeah. you know, autoflower.net and, right. and, and seeing those. So, so give your plug for autoflower taste. Yeah, so I'm a vaporizer. I, I, I vaporize flour. I haven't combusted in maybe three years. Uh, there's a wonderful web, uh, website, incidentally, called FC Combustion, and you can guess what the FC stands for. But um, uh, these auto flowers, they taste just like regular cannabis. It's delicious stuff. Uh, and the numbers on it, if you're, if you're into numbers, I think it's a fool's game. You know, if, if, you, can't get, if you can't get stoned because your number is only 6% <laughs> THC, then take another hit, for God's sakes. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the idea that you got to buy a 30 to get stoned is just so, you know. Anyway, uh, they taste delicious. They have this, they, the, the oils are phenomenal. And, you know, I, when I do it with other people, a lot of times my, my friends up in Anchorage, they go, Man, these things grow so fast they don't have time to, to, to rot. You know, I said, what are you talking about? He says, there's nothing bad tasting. You know, it's 
obviously the guy was very stoned. Um, <laughs> they are just like regular cannabis. They didn't used to be, but they are now. And I, and I would defy you to tell the difference between uh, vaporizing an auto flower uh, and vaporizing a, a, a regular uh, photo period. There, there is no difference whatsoever. I, I would agree with that. And uh, it's, you know, 65 to 70 percent of them are myrcene dominant. So what we're seeing, out, it was fun to walk through and take a look at the, uh, the flowers that were entered for the competition this year and see the different terpene profiles and watch the evolution of, of what growers and breeders are targeting at this point. Go through and count how many are myrcene dominant this year compared to years past versus terpenaline dominant mm -hmm. plants. That's the that's a big thing. It's your 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 fuel flavor, your diesel flavor, uh, terpenaline, beta caryophylline, alpha pinene. Uh, we're seeing that now emerge in in auto flowering plants as well. And it's a little bit more difficult with auto flowering plants, uh, just because of the the breeding that we were talking about earlier. But they definitely pack all of the flavor. And to be perfectly honest, the the potency as well. Out of our our type four high CBG varieties um, that we've developed. The individual plant that has uh, far and away had the highest overall CBG percentage uh, was an auto flowering plant. And it came in at uh, almost 16% CBG. Uh, it was over 17% CBGA before decarbing. Uh, so it's, it's definitely possible to create absolutely terpene rich, cannabinoid heavy, uh, and diverse chemotypes uh, with, with these day neutral plants. And, and I know that you're heavy in the analytics and you test everything in-house. Do their numbers come out comparable to photosensitive plants as well? On average, they tend to be a little bit lower, but it also depends on the way that you treat them and, and the light spectrum. Don't uh, they also have a little bit more CBD? Well, you can change any of those. Well, of course yeah. you can. <laughs> but I mean, from an amateur grower, it seems to me that there, there's always CBD in my auto flowers, uh, but, but I'm not sure there is in my bigger plants. I don't know, but... Yeah, we, we haven't seen that. Um, CBC, uh, there is a little bit more CBC. Mm. It, there, at least there tends to be. And that, that actually, it depends on the varieties that you're looking at. But it is, it is definitely present in auto-flowering plants. Let's dispel another rumor about taste. Um, uh, I know that you spend a lot of time breeding them. And a lot of people say, OK, so this is a cookies autoflower. So essentially that means that's cookies crossed with a, a ruderalis plant. And, and a lot of people say the ruder rooty plants taste like crap, right? So, so what do you have to say about people saying that there's all this like uh, this, this ruderalis terpenes coming along for the ride? Uh, there used to be. I think that used to be a valid, a valid, uh, valid distinction. Um, one of the main things to consider as well is normally what you're trying to do in a breeding program is look at the F2. So you take two parents that are very divergent, cross them, and then do it either an open pollination or a targeted selfing in the, uh, the F1 generation. And then you have F2 plants that exhibit every possible combination or permutation that you can possibly imagine. It's where the most diversity is expressed. If you're a plant breeder, that's where you should be looking for amazing things. If you have a specific terpene profile that you're trying to target, you can't overlook that F1 cross because that's, uh, that's actually where you would identify the plants that have the most uh, similar profiles to whatever it is that you're trying to target. So yeah, you can you can very I won't say very easily, but you could take a you know a GG4 and cross it to an auto flowering plant, and then do your initial selection in that F1 inbreed it one more time, and you can you can lock those terpene profiles in. Uh, it obviously takes more time for stabilization of traits and that sort of thing, but uh, terpenes and making them taste good, we can do that. Absolutely. So uh, we're running out of time here. So uh, uh, I'm sure that you want to hear more from both of these folks. So for Jeff Lowenfels, you can find um, uh, his, uh, at least one episode with him on the Shaping Fire podcast if you go to shapingfire.com. Um, I also have several of uh, Jeff's presentations for, for at uh, various conferences on uh, my YouTube channel at forward slash Shango Lowe's. Um, uh, Seth has been on my show to talk about both uh, the new age CBD autoflowers that are out there, and then again with a really uh, insightful interview on um, uh, the, the nexus of, of CBD and, and, um, and hemp in the, uh, the, the new economics of CBD from hemp. And, uh, and then, of course, don't forget about Jeff's book coming out in October. You can order it on Amazon today. You can already pre-order it on Amazon now. So uh, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. It's been very uh, informative. Thank you. Thanks for having us.